talked about maps, and so if you if you recall, we talked about things like uh, projections, um, and we like analyzed some different kinds of projections. What are the drawbacks? Essentially, in a nutshell, the problem is that when we project a, a, a globe onto a flat uh, surface, like on a on paper or on a screen, we have to make some trade-offs. What kinds of information do we want to preserve? Um, we talked about Mercator projection that was kind of like unfair to the global south um, for like, if you want to kind of like just visualize um, things about the world. Um, and here is the Alvers equal. Uh, no, sorry, this is the Winkler triple projection that is about like that kind of like makes some more suitable compromises for political purposes. Um, and then we started talking about some like um, direct visualization of dots on top of maps. Um, um, and um, we'll continue now with choropleth maps. <coughs> um, okay, so what are choropleth maps? The, the principle here is that areas are shaded or patterned in proportion to some kind of uh, measurement or some data. And each, each spatial unit is filled with a uniform color or pattern. Um, and so we've seen examples of this. Um, here is an early example like about literacy and, or illiteracy in France, um, in like districts in France from 1826. So you see that this, is, um, this was fairly like, common early on. And of course, it's okay, like an easy way to do that. Um, but generally, like, one thing that you always have to be careful about, especially with choroplast math, is that um, what you really visualize in a certain area, like here, uh, or uh, like who voted for a political party, all of this is very strongly dependent on the people living there. And there's other effects, of course, that um, not just population, but uh, like if you like, well, yeah, things are not um, equally distributed across space, right? And if if this is what you want to visualize, like visualizing population, then that's good. But if you want to visualize something derived, you need to make that explicit in some way. Um, so here's like a population map of the United States that uses 3D. So like we can talk about whether this is appropriate here or not. Um, but what you can see essentially is like that we have like a fairly densely populated um, East Coast, especially the Northeast, um, and then a fairly populated uh, California, um, and then there's like. Uh, big tower somewhere in the middle of essentially the desert, like Vegas or Salt Lake or Phoenix or Denver. Um, so that's always like what, especially in the context of the United States, it's kind of like we, we have an idea of what this means. But of course, in, uh, if we look in the con context of the world, we might not be totally aware that Indonesia is actually like a country where there's a lot of people but not a lot of land. So they might be like underrepresented in, in uh, these kinds of core plus maps. Um, so, like we talked, we had an example of a choropleth map earlier that showed just like win loss uh, by party. Um, here, this this shows also um, like the win margin. Um, so, what do you think? Is this a better map than the one before that we had as the example last time? Is it better? Who thinks it's better? Okay, a couple of people think it's better. Who thinks it's good? So I would say it's better, but not necessarily good. Right? Uh, what we get, what we get out of this map is like a uh, like a margin of victory, um, but it still has the problem of like essentially these counties here in Utah, they're more or less empty. Right? There's neighborhoods in Salt Lake City with more uh, people living in them. Um, if we do this by population density, we get something like this. Um, and so here, th these are like smaller dots, um, and, and I guess like you can get a sense that you have like a roughly equal distribution uh, between Kerry and Bush. There's more red still, and uh, Bush also won the election, uh, but it, 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 you get a little bit of a better sense of it. But still, it's not an ideal representation. Um, so one thing, especially like if you have uh, if you have something um, like dense population or very sparse population. There's one approach that I really like. This is from a paper by Michael Correll and Jeff Hare. Um, they call this surprise maps. Um, and the idea is that it's kind of like a Bayesian approach almost. They use a prior and then show the difference between this prior um, and what you actually see in the data. 
So, like, what the, the example in their paper is, um, like, they show um, event density across Canada, Canadian provinces for a certain type of crime. It's called mischief. This is just a classification, a legal term that is used in, in Canada. Um, and so, what you see is that, well, it looks like uh, Ontario really is like a pretty rough place to live. But in fact, there's a lot of people that live in Ontario, right? And so, what you obviously want to do is you want to normalize this by population. Uh, but and this is what you get there, and then you see kind of like this effect um, uh, in Ontario completely disappears. So Ontario seems to be like has a mischief rate about equal to the rest of the country. Instead, we see this is Saskatchewan, I think, here, uh, pop a little bit, but then Nunavut is now like a big uh, outlier. And so why, anybody have an idea why that is? Anybody ever heard of this myth that small schools are way better uh, for educational outcomes than larger schools? Um, what do you think? Like those two things have something in common. Any guesses? Yeah? Is it just that your population is so small? You have a small population, yeah, and that can kind of lead to errors, right? Um, so that you have some, yeah? Yeah, so you have like a, a slight effect size, but it's amplified by the idea of Exactly, and if you have a small population, um, it's also not unlikely that you just have outliers, right? So if you actually looked at the school data, you will find that there is the best performing schools are very small, but also the worst performing schools are very small. So there's just like a, a random blip that some, like a class is particularly good, which is kind of washed out if you have a thousand students in your school, but if you have 10 students in your school, the like random quality of the students in the school will matter a lot. And so what they do here is they, they create a surprise map uh, that, uh, con that considers this law of the, these, these effects of small numbers and kind of discounts that if you have any outliers that are caused by very small numbers. So they have here a model of population density plus accounting for the variability when analyzing small numbers. Um, and so if you do that, you see like this, you get the sign surprise map and so you see that you have like slightly higher rates of mischief uh, in like the western uh, in Western Canada and slightly lower rate in uh, in Eastern Canada. And of course, this is like not a principle that applies only to maps, but uh, you could apply this in in any uh, in, in any kind of like data set. If you have some kind of like smaller uh, smaller unit that you need to analyze along with some bigger units, you might want to do a correction like this. Um, if you look at something like this for unemployment, so for example, it's very common to, to look, uh, like, and it's often like, um, important for political decision making, looking at unemployment rate across, uh, 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 across the United States, right? And so we, we usually think that rural areas have high unemployment. Um, and um, like you see, like, in, if you have per capita unemployment rates, you see kind of like some weird patches happening, right? And so, like there's low unemployment, uh, there's high unemployment in California, and then there's high unemployment in Michigan, but also throughout the East, but it kind of like varies a lot by county. But if you do this with the surprise map, if you account for this small counties, you see that this actually goes away mostly. So like all of the like middle America essentially is now like not particularly surprising, right? This is what you statistically would expect, uh, but you still see this persistent um, Low, uh, like high unemployment rates in California, in Michigan, and then in the in the South. Um, so if, by by doing something like this, you can actually check <laughs> like. Um, and then one thing, like people have actually used the, this is not nest. Well, it's a core class map on a on a smaller level, right? So we have. And so you kind of can see the influence of like what are the team, what do what who, who likes which teams, and you kind of see that. There is like a geographic uh, like density. Basically, there's a very hard line here between Red Sox and Yankee territory, right? Like New England, all Red Sox, Yankees, all that, like all the other, like on um, New York State. Um, and how do you think you could create, like what, where could you get the data for that? Yeah, yeah. You can scrape Facebook, right? People post. Publicly, their allegiance to the sports team, and so you, this is actually how the, this is a New York Times visualization. Uh, this is how they did that. Um, so it's Utah. It's like 
Well, what's who's rooting for which baseball team in Utah, right? It's it's like I don't know. People usually root for the baseball team where they came, lived before they came to Utah, probably. Um, so we see I don't know. Uh, but it's interesting. Like this is basketball, uh, and basketball. This is 2014, uh, and you see that there's some franchises in basketball, especially the Lakers here. Um, that kind of like dominate all of the markets where there is no home team, right? Um, so you see that, um, like of course in California, but also here, like in the, in the north, like, they, like Montana actually prefers the Lakers to the Jazz. Um, and then what I also like is like you think of the Toronto Raptors as a Canadian team, but not like clearly in Ontario, but not in Quebec, right? Quebec, well, like think of like okay, we rather have the Lakers than like. A, a team from the English-speaking neighbor here. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I find those fascinating and interesting. I'm, I'm sure this has changed, like with like since the Boreas uh, rose and fell. Um, but this is, of course, always changing. Um, uh, here is a map that isn't necessarily like a chloroplast map. Uh, well, in some way, it's kind of like uh, a mix between a cartogram, which we'll talk about later, uh, and a chloroplast map. This kind of like is a Bloomberg visualization of land use. Um, and what you see is like there's different, uh, like there's um, pasture land, forest land, crop land, special use land, uh, miscellaneous, uh, and urban. Um, and this, uh, I guess special use includes military. And so you see um, like the big military test, test range out here um, in Western Utah. Um, and if you actually go to this website, um, like this is the map at the top, so this gives you. Uh, okay, I have blocker. Um, if you um, if you go to this website, you see like it starts off like this, but then like it's always tricky to understand like these quantities, and so now they kind of like reshape it for us. Like how like what's the proportion of like pasture uh, across the United States, right? From a very mosaic map like this, it's a little bit tricky. But if you represent it like this, and now we've kind of lost the spatial correlation, but we we kind of can understand the magnitude of these land uses. So we see that pasture or rangeland is like the biggest chunk, and then we have forest, and then we have a lot of cropland, and then we have special use and um, miscellaneous, and urban is actually fairly small. Yep. See that's. I feel like the visualization is also a little problematic because it puts urban all in New England where there's less vertical space. So, like actually, yeah, it's it's not it's not perfect. It just like tries to reframe it. Um, so like yes, if you did for example like a bar chart that you just created out of those blocks, that would be um, like a, you would understand the proportions better. But I think what you can do from this is you can like make analogies that people understand. You can say like. Um, the pasture is basically everything, um, well, almost everything west or pasture and forest together is basically corresponds to about as much as all the land west of the Mississippi, right? And that's kind of an analogy that is kind of like a little bit more tangible for users. Um, and so, yes, you're losing this precise sense of proportion, but you can like, you put it a little bit in terms of what people understand. But they actually give you a little bit more context down here. So. Here now they highlight some specific areas, so urban area, like where it actually is found, urban area mapped to the space, um, and then you can keep do doing uh, this for different types, but now you have like an abstract representation of the land use, yeah? Interesting to me, they're probably not using shape files, right? They, they probably did reconstruct it. Yeah, um, they yeah, probably did some kind of, did they, I'm sure they initialized it with a shapefile. I'm sure they have this data by uh, like a census district, but then they kind of like binned it into um, into these rectangles. And exactly how they did that, I'm not so sure. But um, there, you can do this with like a force. Well, you have some optimization approach, or you can do it manually if you want to. Like uh, it's possible for this scale. Um, so here you have like a tree map representation. Um, that kind of explains that you can keep going and so on. Um, but yeah, well, what is this? This is um, agricultural, uh, the great livestock grazing. 
uh, and agricultural output, and so on. So that this is like a nice uh, visualization that kind of is between the coral path um, and the cartogram. So um, one alternative to um, coral cleft maps um, that kind of like gets away from this problem of um, like having um, representing an area by its uh, by its size is a proportional symbol map. And so the idea here is to use a symbol instead of just color coding it and then scaling the symbol according to the data. And so the, here is a simple example. This is um, carry versus Bush bottom margins um, shown by circles. Um, and so you kind of like get the sense that it's super dense um, in, the, in the east, of course, and you see that there is all of these big blue bubbles. Um, they use transparency because we have these dense regions to use transparency so that we can like, see that where there is a lot of bubbles overlapping. Um, and so what do you think compared to a choropleth map? Much better. Much better, I would agree, but it's still not perfect, right? Because we have these like these overlapping regions, so there might be like even though we have the transparency here, we don't really have a good sense of like how big the population um, up here is. Um, this is a like map that you might have seen. This was in the um, probably New York Times. Um, this is basically um, a different type of proportional symbol. Here is kind of like how the 2016 election, how the political sentiment swung compared to the uh, to 2012, to the previous election, right? Um, and so uh, it, an arrow pointing to the right is politically right, an arrow pointing to the left is politically left. The size of the arrow is how big the this, this swing was. And you can see that essentially, like, mo like across most of the United States, People voted much more conservative than they did in the 2012 election, with one exception. Utah is a big outlier here. Why? Yes, Romney was running. Um, and so people liked Romney in Utah much more uh, than they did Trump. Um, and we see, of course, some other out, um, outliers in urban areas, um, like here in San Francisco area, also in Atlanta, uh, in the Atlanta region. Um, and so I think this is kind of like a a neat visualization because it combines um, it combines something that we think of in abstract terms like right and left of the political spectrum with like an explicit representation, uh, and it, it feels almost like it shows a bit of a like a wind. Um, so I think it's also kind of like a nice analogy in some way. Um, and you can like keep scrolling. They do this nice storytelling and kind of highlight like what are the regions uh, that were particularly important to Trump's victory. Uh, and then here, where, where did uh, Clinton make gains? And you see that it's basically like mostly, like as I mentioned, uh, so like Utah and urban areas, um, and so on. Um, here is an alternative uh, representation. Um, here, like you have the color codes the winner. Um, the height is the total number of votes cast, and the width is the margin of net votes. And so you essentially have like. Um, mountains, um, kind of like a mountain analogy, and you see like Chicago here, there's a lot of people and the margin was pretty big. So what do you think about this visualization? It's hard for me to have to think through the triangle representation. Yeah, exactly. Um, they, they rotated the map. That's true as well. I'm also sure, not sure that there's that much new information gained because the big cities are the tallest ones. They also have the widest margins. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think all of you guys are right here. I think of this as almost like chair of faces, right? Um, they like they encode data in, in glyphs that they aren't necessarily intuitive to read, right? You have to like actually look at a, gl a particular glyph. And then think about how, like, how wide is it and how high is it, um, and all of this in net votes. So this is like fairly, fairly tricky to read. So like, I don't think this is a particularly good visualization here. Um, here is another one that I showed um, before. This this uses also proportional symbols. In this case, circles of where did people move to after 
uh, Hurricane Katrina. Um, and this is kind of like, um, because we have this like massive black area, this is kind of like a, a nice visualization, but it also suffers from the overlap a lot. So like it, we kind of like maybe get a wrong sense uh, that people people mostly still stayed in the area. I think more so than we would look that than we would interpret from this map because we see still a lot of outside black here. Um, here is a map that uses proportional symbols to visualize uh, who donated to John Kerry and George Bush um, overlaid on Manhattan, and you can kind of see some political trends within Manhattan. So the um, Upper East Side was more conservative than the Upper West Side, um, and so on. Um, but like this, these circles, they kind of have been super popular, uh, but they like they have their problems, right? So they're not the perfect solution uh, for all of the reasons, especially overlap that we talked about. Also, if you have like a big circle. Where does it actually like? Where it, where is it located, and so on? So it, it's just not it, it's not the perfect solution. It's better than just pure carbon maps, especially for everything related to population. But it's still not the perfect solution. Um, this is a visualization that is unfortunately offline, but um, I, I think this is fairly uh, like uh, a fun uh, piece where you, um, they visualize um, the. Like most frequent surnames on top of the map of the United States, and so you get a bit of a sense of like more, what are the cultural influences um, of a place. Uh, this is like the Northeast, and you see that like around Boston there is this influence of Irish names of Sullivan, Murphy, O'Brien, Kelly, McCarty, and so on. Um, unfortunately, there isn't. This is offline; you can't look at other regions anymore. Um, and then one way of visualizing this, uh, like data on top of a map, um, is fat fonts. And this is kind of like, I think of this more of as like a, an art project, right? This isn't necessarily um, an explicit visualization that is all that helpful, but it's kind of like, it, it's engaging. Um, so the idea is to scale the visual, like how dark a letter appears um, according to its magnitude. And so you see that. Uh, a one here takes up very little black space in the square that is assigned, whereas a nine is very prominent. So there's a lot of dark ink. And so at a distance, a nine appears much stronger and darker than a one does. And then you can do stuff like visualize um, elevation. And now you could actually go in close and read off the number. Um, so I do this even for nested, so this would be Four, eight, nine, so almost five. Uh, but if you had something like here, you have nine, nine, and so you can see this is almost black. Um, you can like order this for populate, like as a poster for the population of the world, um, and and then you can kind of like get a sense of like both visually but also numerically of what is what is the data that is underlying this. But again, I think this is more of like an art uh, project than like. An, Strictly speaking, a data visualization. So uh, next, I want to talk a little bit about contour maps or isoclast maps. Um, we are most familiar with contour maps for elevations, but they have also been used um, in, in other contexts. If we want to visualize something continuous um, on uh, on the surface of the Earth, so here is an example, an early example that shows uh, lines of eco magnetic declination. Of course, something that is important. Uh, for um, like navigating the oceans, um, we like this is the, the case that we are most familiar with, right? Where we show like elevation changes in hiking maps and topographic maps uh, with these um, contours, these isocontours, and so by essentially counting them, we can, for example, measure or like uh, read off the map how much elevation we have to like hike up uh, on if we want to get to this particular peak, for example. Um, so those are useful, and they also have like by, they kind of have this nice property that if they like this this region here, we see that this is fairly steep, right? And this is kind of like because we have all of those contours very close to each other, um, it kind of pops out, and so we get our attention is drawn to this um, to this area of density that is like very steep here. Um, and you can also like visualize these contours. 
Um, like you've seen the, this uh, stuff before, I'm sure. Like here is a contour of that, that is used to visualize the uncertainty. Like you have a this is a hurricane forecast map. So you have a projected path of the storm, um, and then you have like a cone or let's say like an um, an area of high impact, and then you have like an outside area of of medium impact. I'm not completely sure whether they also show the no, this is like after the fact, so there is no no prediction or uncertainty in here. So this just shows different like different um, levels of like uh, wind speed um, in, in uh, on this map here. Um, okay, I actually didn't bring uh, printouts for this, so I forgot about that. But uh, we can look at this. This is kind of like a, a complex. The idea of this particular piece here. Is um, that we like the problem of these um, of these uh, proportional symbol maps is that they overlap um, that they overlap with the like with each other and the idea of these necklace maps here is that they um, kind of like arrange them on these uh, like spatially but they don't precisely place it they just place it as close as possible um, and uh, they use color. To, to show the association. So like here, Utah is in green, and so you see the, the bubble of Utah, and then the, the, uh, the, the state of Utah had it in green, and California here is in this teal, um, and Nevada in this bluish color, and so on. Um, and now here, the circles are like, we, can, we have kind of like, we can avoid that they overlap by doing this. So what do you think about this approach? If you're if you're already removing the data from the spatial location, then why are you using the map? Is my question. Like, is the data and how it's encoded, like the channel, is separate from the spatial location, except for the, the position that I was beside? Um, so it seems to me like the map is unnecessary. Yeah. So like, we kind of like remove the spatial context. So why do we need a map? Yeah. I don't know where all the states are, um, then having that kind of underneath as a reference would be useful. Like, I don't know all the states in the Netherlands. Really yeah. Well, but like, being able to see that generally, like, okay, I know what that is. So, like, it, it may be useful for specific government cases. Yeah. That's a good point. Overall, I kind of like it. So, the connections make me think that there were some meaningful groups to the, the rings and the necklaces. Yeah. That's a good question. Like, I think that they actually define this manually. This is like a um, they place it. Um, I think they, they they place it automatically, but they define the groups and the circles manually in the paper. So it would be a pretty fancy algorithm if they did this um, completely automatically. Especially since they also have these half circles down there, right? So there's a lot of stuff going on here. Yeah. I think it's better on the one on the right. Does it makes the arrows not collide as much? Yeah. Yeah, so if you want to do something like this, show flow, uh, then yeah, very much so. Like this makes uh, like much more sense. This would be almost impossible, especially if you have uh, states or counties that kind of like are immediately adjacent to each other. Um, so yeah, like if you have an unfamiliar uh, like um, space like the Netherlands here, uh, like states in the, in the Netherlands, um, and especially if you want to show flow, maybe not such a bad idea. Um, so it kind of tries to solve some of the problems of, uh, of proportional symbol maps, uh, but of course introduces new problems. So it's kind of like a different kind of compromise, um, I would say. Um, I'll, I'll get to this in a second. Now, actually. Um, so like one way of like showing size proportional to an area is to actually like not visualize it explicitly in the real shape, the area, but to modify the shape, and that's what cartograms do. Um, and so here we have this um, this example again, um, where we have the 2004 Bush versus Kerry popular vote, and if we uh, just change the size on the map, where we try to find a compromise between geospatial accuracy and the quality of the data encoding. <coughs> 
we would get something like, uh, like this is like a different example here, but we would get a cartogram here. This is word population, um, and just roughly placed by uh, where those countries are, so you get some kind of context, right? So you have, uh, this is in 1916, so there are some like outdated terms here, like Chinese Empire, Indian Empire. Um, and, but, but you kind of like have a good sense of where things are, but you can't, of course, read that Russia actually goes all the way uh, to the West Coast. But um, it's kind of like a compromise. You have some familiar geography, um, but you explicitly visualize the size in like more understandable shapes. So what do you think about this particular map? Yeah, so I think like, what, you, what you're getting at is like if you have roughly a sense of the geography, right, this is useful, and you can still like I can look at um, like this area here. I might not know the exact geography, but Java, which is now uh, Indonesia, if I'm not mistaken, um, is like fairly prominent. We have a sense of where in the world is it approximately, um, but it's not like it doesn't like. Um, we, we have a proper uh, representation of the data. Um, and so here's like a current one, the world population in 2018. This is from Our World in Data, which is kind of like um, uh, this nice website that tries to collect facts about the world. Um, and this is a little bit of a different approach. Here they, they don't use like one big rectangle, but they use like lots of little rectangles and, and place them roughly um, of where they are. And so you see, Canada is essentially like this thin sliver uh, on the northern uh, border. Uh, you have India, which is like um, like a massive, uh, like way bigger than it is uh, in, in terms of space usually, and Russia is comparatively small here. And so there's many examples of these cartograms. Uh, here is like what uh, what year in what different economies are buying. This is again something. Yeah. So, like um, clothing and footwear, like um, the United States buys about 430 billion of clothing and footwear. Um, if we look at, and um, this is per capita spending, so we see that like many Western countries spend a lot per capita. Russia spends less than the Western countries, um, and China even less so. If you look at who spends a lot of money on alcohol and tobacco, uh, we see that the United States uh, is, is less so, but then we have here Ireland spends a lot of money, uh, at least per capita, on, on uh, alcohol and tobacco. Electronics, also goods, uh, or recreation, and so uh, we see these like nice transitions here. Okay, so like one example, like an early example of cartograms, um, like computer-based cartograms, precise cartograms, are, are these ones here. So here we have our original map, um, and here we have um, a map scaled by population. So we kind of see that with like China and India again, and Canada's thin sliver, uh, but compare that to the map that I showed you earlier, this one, like which one do you like better? The square one. The square one. Why so? It's easier to read the smaller countries. Yeah. You always have like a like a discrete mark for each country or state, right? But you're kind of like giving up a little bit. This doesn't. This is clearly doesn't look like a uh, map. Uh, or even like something like this clearly is not a map. And this look, this is a little bit closer to the map metaphor, uh, but still, uh, it's kind of like these super odd shapes, right? Um, especially if you just use squares, we can actually judge fairly accurately the magnitude. But here, like telling is like Nigeria or Mexico, the, 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 which of those two countries has more population is almost impossible, right? If we scale this whole the world by GDP, 
Uh, this is what happens uh, if we scale the world by child mortality. Uh, we get this, uh, or by greenhouse emissions per capita. Or? Um, I think this is total greenhouse emissions. Uh, or if we visualize Kerry versus Bush, uh, so basically show a political map. But like, why? Like this clearly didn't catch on, right? Uh, <laughs> because like here, this is really useless because we can't really identify. Like, we can identify Florida and north and south and east and west, but nothing beyond that, right? So uh, this isn't like particularly. Um, useful to do that. So here's like how people nowadays use cartograms. So this is a, a cartogram of the uh, 2018 house elections, um, which is kind of like nice because uh, house districts, we have enough rectangles so that we have, and they correspond roughly to the population. So we kind of like um, have something to work with to emulate those shapes. And so we get like a nice shape of California, of Utah, and so on. Um, and we can actually explicitly visualize for each district how uh, how it turned out. So um, the end, but the end, we can also label them. Like they, they have a lot of white space in here, and they use the two state country uh, the two state uh, short codes to or actually use some kind of abbreviation for each state um, to 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 show like the, to visualize the name of the state. And I think this is like a really good example. Right? This really communicates it super well. Um, here's a different uh, take on this uh, with these hexagonal bins for the Guardian. I think this is like anybody prefer one over the other? My personal opinion is that both are pretty good and it's really just taste preference. I think just Hex bins are sometimes easier uh, to create some shapes that you want, um, but I think that the, this is like um, hand drawn in the New York Times, I'm assuming, so they did a really good job. And so here's a comparison of six different cartograms that were used to visualize the 2018 election. Um, and so you see like The Guardian and The New York Times, and like I really like those two approaches. Uh, but if you look at the political map down here, like that's actually pretty bad, right? Uh, they have they, they use proportional symbols here, but this is kind of like we have all of this white space where um, the, their population density is low, uh, and and Washington Post used a more explicit like a cartogram a little bit along the lines of our world in data that I showed earlier. Um, it makes it a little bit harder to read in my personal opinion, and like Axios and Bloomberg did the same thing. So it's, I think it's easier to understand to, to to understand like. What are the outcomes in each state in those two examples than it is in these like more explicit paragraphs? <coughs> Any questions about paragraphs before you move on? So is there none from CNN or Fox News? <laughs> uh, they, they still use uh, core platforms. <laughs> At least Fox News. <laughs> OK, a um, couple of words on flow maps. Um, flow maps are like useful when we want to see like relationships between different geospatial areas. Um, so here is an example of, early, of an early flow map of like where are people. And this also makes a lot of sense in this, this particular geospatial context. Like where are people being transported in Ireland? So you see that there's Dublin as this big cap, um, and we have these like Big um, path of transportation uh, radiating out of Dublin. Uh, you've seen this one, right? I'm not going to talk about this too much again, but this is kind of like a the, the Minars map of Napoleon's Russian campaign, where you see kind of like the geospatial context of um, where the the Russian campaign happened, um, but also see the size of the army encoded in the width of this flow here. Um, and then you have uh, flow for things like wind. Um, so this is like an early example of um, the prevailing winds um, across the oceans. Again, probably used for uh, navigation. So we see this is like with this, these dashes. Um, this is like a way of flow visualization with these stipples. Um, and you can have a good sense of 
like what is the typical wind direction um, in each of these areas. Um, you might have seen this one here. This is kind of like a, a, a wind map of the United States. This is actually current winds. Um, and the technique that they use here like, um, is something that is like, I'm not sure what it's exactly that, but usually you call this line integral convolution. Um, so if you want to learn more about these kind of flow visualization techniques, um, Christian, or actually Valeria Pascucci will teach the advanced, uh, uh, the, the scientific visualization class next semester, and they will cover flow like this in, in also in 3D or in, in, in all kinds of contexts. Um, what is nice about this one here is that you can that you also have a gallery of interesting events in the past, and so here you have Hurricane Sandy, um, and you can kind of like very clearly see with super easy like <coughs> graphical marks and animation of like what the what the hurricane how the hurricane um, looked like, and you have this nice map here. It kind of uses a combination of like actual speed um, and also brightness um, to encode the data here. Um, and then you've probably seen like in, in like high school or geography, uh, you've seen things like this uh, where you have trade maps, right? So here we have the cotton trade between uh, the um, uh, the United States and the UK before and after the Civil War, and so you see that essentially. Like the UK got most of its cotton from the United States before the Civil War, but then afterwards, barely any, most of this came then from, I'm assuming, India, uh, what is the yellow um, piece here. So you can overlay these flows like for abstract things. Um, basically, this is a network representation, right? Um, and you could do this also for uh, migration of people. So here is a uh, Example from uh, Forbes. So, where do people move uh, from? So, for example, if I pick Wasatch County or Summit County, Park City, we see that they're like, where do people, like, inbound is blue, outbound is red. So, people tend to move from, to Park City from like Southern California uh, or Florida, or, and they tend to move to like the Seattle area. Um, so you can kind of like interactively like click on any area, let's say Cape Cod here. At Cape Cod, there's a little, like a lot of people that move to Florida uh, afterwards. And like if you look at Phoenix, wow, there's a lot of big migration in and out of Phoenix. Um, so uh, this map, like there's a, of course, like <laughs> this is a lecture about maps, but I always want to emphasize. Uh, there is often a non-spatial uh, representation because, like, here is a similar approach, um, but uses something uh, like uh, a similar, like similar data set, but uses a completely different approach. Uh, for like, this is a piece by the New York Times where you can look for every state uh, where did people like move to um, and where did they come from. So I can. Uh, well, let's go migration into California. Um, so we see that uh, over time, even in the 1900s, like only half of the people that lived in California were actually born in California, and this proportion has increased. Um, and we see down here that this proportion, like uh, born outside the U.S., has uh, increased over um, like over the last couple of years. Where, but the proportion of people in the Midwest that moved to California has decreased. So you can actually look at this for Utah. So you see that um, people um, in Utah, like basically in the 1900s, they were born in Utah, and 20, uh, uh, like 66% were born in Utah. In 2012, we still have 62% of people that were born in Utah. Uh, but uh, migration from other states in the West and kind of like is a big factor and then like nine percent of people were born outside the, of the US uh, of the US. And if you look at where do Utahns move, we see that like lots of Utahns stay in Utah uh, or they move to California or but this is decreased or they move uh, they stay in the West but move to another state. Um, so it's a kind of completely different representation right but because we've given up the spatial context here, we can do like a lot more with it. Um, we can kind of like show this over time. Uh, we can show these trends. 
Um, and one thing that they also did here, like this is like not a raw data visualization, like the Forbes one. Um, like the Forbes one shows every county to every county exactly, uh, like representing the data. They really do a lot of aggregation here, right? So they 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 pull out Idaho and California, and then summarize other states in the West. So they they they, they are much much smarter about how they um, aggregate things in the context of each. Uh, of each state, so like Idaho doesn't show up in others. Like here, Idaho isn't is not like if you talk about Texas, um, Idaho is not on this map. So they have like a specific um, curation of what is interesting for each of the states. Um, here's a flow map that shows um, rail freight tonnage, um, and so like we see that we have like this. This is probably coal. That is being shipped from the Dakotas here um, across the United States, and so you see that there's what, like what what the flow um, of, uh, of of transportation transported goods um, is on rail um, in the United States, or something like this. Um, and then you can also like do this visualization uh, for um, like flight data. So this is like a uh, flights over France. Um, and flights, of course, have not only 2D value, but they also have 3D values. So that, like, what, what elevations are those planes uh, moving around? And so this paper here introduces, like, this um, pretty fancy set of, of interaction techniques, uh, both in 2D and 3D and in derived plots, uh, to kind of analyze this kind of flow data. And so they've been doing this for the French, uh, like, um, Airspace Agency, um, and so you can see that they have kind of like this, but like very generic, almost tableau style way of mapping longitude here to x, latitude to y, um, and altitude to color. And now they map altitude to uh, to y, and now we see like how, how like we have these layers where planes travel, at different layers, and then for ascent and descent, they actually like drop down to these airports. And so here, like they show how they, how you can brush these kinds of flows. Um, you can extract them, and now this is like stuff that comes from outside of the country into one particular airport. And then you can see clearly like from those layers, they land at those particular locations. And then there's some outliers here, like low altitude aircraft. Those are yeah. Well, okay. I think I can have to show it more than. Great. So, like, a little bit similar to what I showed er, like at the beginning of like showing these explicit points on top of a map, you can actually create a map just by showing those points. So the idea here of data-driven maps is don't even show a map; just use the data, and the map will appear. So here is um, a map of all zip codes in the United States. Each zip code here <laughs> is centered. Um, in, um, uh, in uh, geographically where the, the zip code is, and then I can type eight, four, and then I can see like here. This is a little hard to see. Uh, so I'm on the screen. Well, I can. Yeah, it's okay. You can see like um, you can type any zip code and see what the geographic distribution is here. Like if I do like where's the one zip code? It's New York. Where's the two zip code? Three, four, five, six, and so on. So there's no map here, right? This is just a latitude and longitude, uh, and the, the, the map just appears out of the data. Um, this one here is, is a similar piece, um, but this shows essentially from the census data, like uh, race and ethnicity of um, people, um, and this is a very, very detailed map, so this is very impressive. Um, so you have, like again, there is no map here. Um, and you can see this is a little bit 
tricky, like we kind of like get the shape for population extents, but it's a little bit tricky um, to like understand where the what the geography is um, in like the West, for example. And I think um, I'm guessing that this here is Utah, but we can add map labels. So this is Denver. So we have Salt Lake City here, um, and so like mostly. This is really like every data point is one uh, one dot, and what if we zoom in here, we can like see like how segregated Salt Lake City actually is, right? Uh, we see essentially that uh, white people live on the west side, um, uh, Hispanic uh, people live on the on the east side, and there is like very few Asian people generally, and they are clustered in university housing. What's a hole? Oh, that's in the map. What's hole? What's a There's hole? There's like a couple holes in the map. Yeah, those are like not residential areas, but they're um, like the university here is like one big hole. Nobody lives on campus, other than in those <laughs> residential buildings here. Um, and these are like commercial areas in downtown. And so, like you will, like it, it is actually fairly shocking on how. Common this kind of segregation is across the United States. Like you will see this in every city. Um, uh, and this is a map uh, that connects um, each zip code to its closest neighbor. Um, and you get like the zip scribble map where you clearly see uh, the borders of the state, or you, you see some of the borders of the states. Uh, and yeah, again, I, I would call this more of an artistic piece. Uh, than a particular like useful visualization, but if you visualize something like taxi drop-offs, uh, use like this is taxi drop-offs again, no map uh, in the um, in, in 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 the New York area, and so you see like Manhattan really lighting up. You see like things like uh, Central Park appear, and then of course like here in the airport um, and like a route from the airport to Manhattan. Um, then we have, like, this is a, an example of particle based visualization. Um, I'll briefly play this video. Project Sand Dance is all about data visualization. How do we make sense of all the massive amounts of data around us? We use principles of information visualization to make it easy to understand the data and see the patterns within the data. So let's take a look at this data set here. These are actually 50,000 counties. But there's information, there's, there's structure in this data. So if we actually map it onto a map, we can actually see the structure showing up. And when we actually shift to a histogram, the motion really helps you understand the data. If we switch back to that, what we go back to. So we're going to actually look at some results from the recent election. So here what I'm going to do is map onto each county how they voted. And you can see actually the blue counties and red counties. And it looks pretty extreme. But actually, it's much more nuanced than this. So if we look at a different palette here, you can see that, uh, yes, it's blue and red, but not quite so extreme on either case. And in fact, we can even break this apart and actually look at nine different graphs. Here are the most extreme on one side, the most extreme on the other side. So if we actually select a point over here and we get some information about it, we can see that that was Texas. So that's how I look at elections, but there are a lot of other things that we can look at besides elections. So we can look at the per capita income. So here's the per capita income. You see a big swath of red across the country. If we actually kind of looked at that in the history of you can see that there are very few counties that have a high per capita income, lots that have a much lower area. So we're interacting with this in a very natural way. So I kind of like this, this idea, right? They represent every data point as a pixel, and, and they, they change it even in these aggregate representations of the histograms. Um, but, but never really like lose this pixel metaphor. So every data point always stays in one discrete unit and just moves around the screen. Unfortunately, like this works for certain data sets, uh, but it, it kind of breaks apart if you have too many pixels or too few, too few of them. Um, but for something like 5,000 counties, this is of course a like a great example. Um, okay, so I want to conclude maps to talk a little bit about thematic maps. And so thematic maps are used like a map metaphor, but are actually not geospatial maps, right? And so you might have seen this. This is like from XKCD. This is the internet as of 2007 with like the big 
MySpace land and the Gulf of YouTube and the Sea of Culture uh, and Orkut, if you remember that, World of Warcraft uh, and AOS. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Wikipedia. Wikipedia often has these kind of semi-structured areas. They have like a table on the right uh, of their front page where they say like influences and influenced uh, uh, or influences and they influence other bands. Um, so that would be one way of, of getting this data. So you could kind of like do some text uh, analysis and using some kind of like semi-structured text to extract this 